Right. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk um, at some length about two sites which were excavated in Esdale in 1984-85. Um, indeed, it's so long ago, I can hardly remember it now. And furthermore, um, the, one of the pictures you'll see has a very tiny image in it, a very tiny little boy um, who actually got married on Saturday. Um, <laughs> So um, it tells you, it gives you some sort of idea of the scale, how long ago this all was. This uh, photograph was taken in 1992. It's a visit by the prehistoric societies to the site. Um, and there, one of the remarks I remember was, well, it doesn't rain here all the time, I don't, I, I don't suppose. And they were wrong. <laughs> it, it, it very nearly did rain there all the time, um, <laughs> plenty. Right down there by the Esk, of course, the white Esk running past. Here is the site of a rig, um, a semi-circular earthwork running down here at the bottom of a deep depression, uh, which you can see me standing, as it were, holding the camera at the top of. Um, water coming down onto that landscape flowed down onto this site from an area of about three square miles. So it was a very wet site indeed. But we won't go there first of all. What we did on this site was to excavate this site because it was thought to be under threat of erosion from the River Esk. And what we thought we'd do is convert that, well not convert it, but incorporate it in a landscape study which had already partly taken place uh, by the Royal Commission for the Ancient Historical Monuments in which we would try and reconstruct the fabric and the function of the local landscape during the first millennium BC. Um, there is the location of the site. You can see in the top two panels there. Also, you get a glimpse of the geology up on the Silurian um, uh, schist in the, uh, running across the whole of the borders of Scotland, an easily fragmented, very acid rock no bone will survive normally, and um, everything very acid and very, as it were, barren in terms of the survival of artifacts. Um, you have at the bottom there the startling feature about Estale, um, the other startling feature being quite how many sheep are there, um, that startling feature being the Samuel Ling Monastery, founded by immensely courageous monks who had made their escape across the Himalayas systematically and methodically machine-gunned as they went um, in order to reach the West and then find uh, Estale. And there, if you get into conversation with the Lama, you find that the selection of this site was by a whole series of cosmological and geographical calculations, which he then extended to various ancient monuments across the landscape. It was a most interesting and enlightening uh, discussion. Here you see a larger scale now. We've closed in to 1 to 25,000 25, map. Obviously on the screen, it's not that. Um, and you see the locations of uh, over rig. Oh, sorry. You do that. Um, over rig here. Castle Oa Hillfort, just up the hill from Oa Rig. It's the Esk, the white Esk coming down. The black Esk running off in this direction. And then, again here, you see the um, uh, Over Rig, sorry, the Castle Oa Over Rig, and the location of the Roman fortlet at Raven Foot. And the course of the Roman road that ran up across here, here to get to Ravenfoot. This has been the study of archaeology for a very long time, this area. It was looked at critically, first of all, by Dr. Richard Bell, an Edinburgh lawyer, um, uh, who was, like all Edinburgh lawyers, full of fun and um, a, a terrific enthusiast of a, a number of curious hobbies. And he uh, would spend his uh, weekends and summers uh, down in Estale. And there he kept a menagerie of flightless birds 
including emus um, and other flightless birds, um, in a uh, arboric, ar ar arboratorium, uh, which he founded there, uh, and, and he lived in the ma mansion house, which existed uh, at Castle Lower itself, uh, just in the, that area there. He um, was the first person to recognize uh, that, that, well, no, he wasn't the first person, first person to publish and to, to attempt to survey um, the linear earthwork system which characterizes this area. Um, it's about four kilometers from there down to there, and you can see the earthworks cover a good deal of that area. We're looking at an area of four, five square kilometers uh, covered by uh, linear earthworks. What were these linear earthworks all about? What were they for? On top of the hill, you have the hill fort at Castle Hour, first recognized by, well, again, first drawn and surveyed um, by Roy, or by chaps with red jackets being pushed around by Roy. And um, the hill fort there is clearly conjoined to, relevant to, and part of this linear earthwork system. We're going to talk about two sites, first of all. First of all, the site at Castle Hour, uh, which um, we carried out excavations on, on a very small scale, and then the site at Uva Rig. And on this slide, you can see how they sit in this complex of earthworks. And amongst those earthworks and around them, the green arrows point to a series of Iron Age farmsteads, which clearly also are relevant to and are referred to by the linear earthwork system. First of all, then, the Castle Lower Hill Fort. And you'll notice straight away, I'm sure, that there's something funny about this hill fort. You have this wonderful array of ring ditch houses linearly arranged on either side of a roadway. And um, it is unlikely you might not think so in a modern setting, but it's very unlikely this is a result of bad planning um, because the gate to the hill fort is offset from the road. And it seems likely to me, at any rate, that this site is similar to a number of other sites of this kind where a hill fort has been built over the top of a palisaded settlement of ring ditch houses, linearly arranged in exactly the same fashion. Hey up now is one, there are a whole series of others. And when that occurs, very often the hill fort ignores the original entrance of the palisaded settlement. In some instances, again, hey up now is an example, the palisaded settlements exist archaeologically and are visible in the field beyond the earthworks. In this instance, it appears to me that the earthworks have eradicated the palisaded settlement. The sequence is quite determined and well by the fact that the inner stone wall, this wall running around here, that construction of that wall has destroyed features of the houses on the interior and has quarried here, a quarry established to build the wall, which has damaged the hill fort here going around. It is also clear that the ditches here in this area have been recut, and therefore one can perhaps, and is perhaps, establish a sequence, ring ditch houses, palisaded settlement, hill fort constructed, hill fort later recut in this area to incorporate a later phase, which was the stone-built hill fort, stone built enclosure, um, with a new entrance, a new reinforced entrance in this area here. So that would appear to be the sequence on the site. The annex to the site, this very characteristic angular annex, runs right the way around, and incorporates here the spring on the site, and therefore would appear to be 
to my mind anyway, uh, for animal retention. Uh, it's difficult to imagine another value for it. Uh, these earthworks are minimal um, and uh, are ideally suited and indeed had uh, fences built on the top, which would imply, again, uh, livestock retention. Um, these, uh, uh, th this uh, annex is certainly later than the early hill fort, but we can establish no relationship between it, the annex, and the Stonewall Fort. It is likely that the Stonewall Fort is later than the annex, but that cannot be proven. Those are English houses. Well, this slide, I hope you'll all be able to see. Simon, am I right? You will be able to see this on in Phil, later on on the net, the lecture? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes. So you'll be able to refer. I'm not going to read all these slides to you. Um, it, it would be very tiresome for you. But um, what you see here are some parallel sites showing these ringditch houses with their linear uh, establishments, showing you the nature of the palisaded settlements to which I've referred, and how these can then be incorporated in later uh, earthworks, which will sometimes reflect, sometimes eradicate uh, those settlements. These, palisade, these um, palisaded settlements with ringditch houses occur in a series of clusters across the southern side of the uplands of eastern Dumfrieshire. And you have here a date line for those palisaded settlements that have uh, ringditch houses within them. It would seem to me this is quite a distinctive artifact type. And the evidence we have so far uh, is that that distinctive artifact type of ring ditch houses found within palisaded enclosures is relatively restricted to the period at and before the middle of the first millennium, let's say 400 to 800 uh, calibrated BC. What this means, this distribution, doesn't seem to me to be taphonomically determined. Then there's no reason why they um, should be uh, occurring in these dense clusters. It may be that we're looking at groups moving in, establishing themselves in new territory on the edge of easily cultivated land, and then budding off a series of what you might call um, genetic, uh, d dynastic um, settlements budding off around them. Again, that's pure interpretation. You'll see that the slides are coloured in a sort of pale magenta uh, if it's, if it's dis discussion, and a nice firm orange if it's actual facts. That's the sort of size and scale of these houses. They are immense. They are the size area of floor of a Edinburgh Victorian semi-detached house of, um, of substance. And they must have lasted probably 20, 30, even 40 years, and well maintained even longer than that. They appear to have been, in order to accommodate people in the lower story with animals, and then perhaps there was an upper story, and perhaps that was used for forage. Back to the sites themselves. Here we have also evidence for the extraordinary amount of labor involved in the foundation of these sites. The palisaded settlement was no simple enclosure. Each house was set on a quarried platform, of which you can see examples here and here. And you then had the roadway, which was cut, leveled, and brought to the gate. And then you have the construction of the earthworks of the hill fort. And the calculation that I have made on that is that it would have taken at least 20 men, at least 44, 43, 45 days to build. So there's a considerable labor. And we're looking at a larger unit, probably, than lived there.
Okay, so that's the background. We're now into the site itself. We're looking at that southwestern entrance with the sort of claw effect hanging off the bottom of the hill fort. So we're looking at this entrance here. And here we seem to, to have an entrance which on excavation showed a series of stages of road laying through the entrance. And then in the foundation levels, you had um, a, a, a series of post holes running up the side of the gate and evidence of burning within the rampart on either side of the gate. It, it seemed to be that we were looking at a vitrified stone debris within the wall and the uh, shading shows the extent of the burning which um, was uh, associated with the wall. The wall, the, the roadway also exhibits a uh, drop slot here um, which uh, was where a gate would have been dropped down into a slot so it could not be uh, thrust or kicked uh, uh, into one side. And that, in again, of itself presupposes there would have been a tower over the gateway, timber linked back into the rampart, and there is the strong suggestion that there was timber within the rampart. I'll come back to that in a moment. The rampart had a ditch outside it, which you see here, into which masses of stone had collapsed. And the rampart behind it was massive. We could only excavate it partly within the resources of the project. Um, I should say that this Hillford excavation was carried out with research funds from the University of Edinburgh, uh, Munro Fund, Abercrombie Fund, and research funds from this society. Uh, it was not part of the budget of the, of the overrig excavation. Um, but the small area we were able to excavate showed quite clear traces of the insertion of horizontal members, which must presumably have been timber, um, within this rampart. They weren't burnt on this side. So we have partial burning of what appears to have been a timber-laced hillfort. The date of that hillfort, as you would see here, is something in the early centuries AD and it must presumably relate, um, one would suggest, to something like 3rd and 4th, maybe 5th century AD, uh, when, it was, when the trees were cut, which built those beams. They don't date, of course, when the site was destroyed. The ditch was excavated um, and Again, it's a, it's a very substantial ditch. It collapsed very suddenly onto a clean surface. The ditch had been cleaned out. This ditch had been recut. And so originally, the hill fort went right around this, the extent of this gateway. And then when the gateway was re-fortified with the stone fort, the ditch was recut. Then, with the collapse of the rampart, through whatever cause, through being despoiled, through being burnt, um, then there was massive collapse into the ditch, and that collapse incorporated, wonderful gift, um, a bone deposit. It must have, it's, it's extraordinary. It must have been a micro environment within that ditch fill uh, which preserved that bone. Um, and uh, it was largely waterlogged, and that must be the secret. Uh, there it is, um, and again, the dates you see, uh, radiocarbon 120 to 540. Um, we're looking at the date, well, third, fourth, fifth century, something like that, maybe, uh, AD. These dates are not good, and um, I'm afraid they are the best we can have, both in terms of the calibration curve 
and also in terms um, of the scarcity of carbon on this site. There was no bone, virtually, and even carbon was hard come by. This is just simply to illustrate the distribution of vitrified forts in, in Scotland. I hope this excavation illustrates how false that distribution may well be. There's no way that you would have ever thought of Castle Ur as being a vitrified fort. Um, and I'm sure that if we were to excavate all the hill forts in Scotland, we would find a great many more vitrified forts than are on this map. Although whether the actual distribution would change uh, is another matter. The other interesting thing is that the radiocarbon dates we have from Castle Ur um, are, in fact, very reflected very closely by Motive Mark and Trusted Hill here in terms of their date. The, photo, the radiocarbon dates for vitrified uh, um, forts as a whole cover the whole span of the, of the, of the life, as it were, of later hill forts anyway uh, in Scotland. And indeed, they cover the whole distribution of hill forts in Scotland. So what is, the, what, what is it that makes people timber lay some forts and not others? And I think that's a question that's very interesting. Um, the only solution I can think is that we have some sort of social factor here that's doing that. Uh, something like castellation uh, was in the Middle Ages. It is a mark of rank, or pretended rank, or perceived rank, or something of that kind. Um, and that you, you timber laced your fort to show something to people. Um, but it is not, if you like, a chronological indicator or a cultural indicator or a locational indicator. So that's the, as it were, phaseology of the hill fort as it comes out with the round houses in their palisaded enclosure, ring ditch houses, and then the roadway interrupted by the insertion of the ring ditch houses at the wet southwest end. Above, uh, there is, that's been one stage of the early development of the site. Then the construction of the hill fort proper, the ditched hill fort. Then the construction of the stone wall and the building of some circular houses in the association with that. And then the construction of the southwestern entrance with its reinforced, its reinforced um, uh, uh, nature here to, 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 as it were, <coughs> act as an impressive entrance for the stone walled fort, and then uh, the annex at some uncertain stage, but later than certainly this and this stage. Just south of the junction of the Black and White Hesk, at this point here, there is another hill fort, Bailey Hill. This hill fort is of a completely different character, but you can see immediately that there's an inner enclosure of, of a sort. We'll come back to that. And then there is this big annex built around the outside. It is precisely similar in format and style to the enclosure uh, the annex, sorry, um, at uh, Castle Lower. So it was an obvious thing to do to look at this hill fort. We could only carry out survey. There was no way excavation could be attempted within the resources of the project. But um, here you have the nature of the inner enclosure at Bailey Hill. And you can see the house types are completely different. The stratigraphical development on the site is completely different. The fortification type is This is a large farmstead or something of that kind. And this has attached to it then this great big enclosure, the annex enclosure around the outside. If you compare the house types um, at Bailey Hill and Castle Ur, um, this is the house diameters compared. These are the types, I'm sorry, the types compared. Um, it's completely different. There is a, a different history of the development on both sites, but at the end of the development of both sites, we have this annex creation. And both sites are associated 
with the linear earthwork set up. Well, I, I, the, the, um, uh, there, there is a book just come out <laughs> with, which uh, goes into this in some detail. Um, but um, I just put this in as a, as a, as a taster um, to the discussion on this. Uh, there are a number of sites in the borders which have these angular, similarly built outworks in annexes built around, in this case, a stone-walled fort built on top of an earthwork fort. Um, this is Lord and Shores, which is um, just there, Lord and Shores. Um, the River Coquette is just off the top of the slide there. Um, is this another site of this kind? There's another at West Hill, which we'll see in a second. Here it is. Uh, it's rather different in construction, but it nevertheless is a similar thing. What are these sites for? Why are they put in these positions? There's also a site at Woden Law, which I haven't really got time to talk about, but interpreted, it could be seen as another site of this type, with a vast annex built around a hill fort, and that annex, um, again, uh, Focal um, to the uh, to a wider system within the S Valley, we looked at the whole question of the distribution of Iron Age farmsteads, and they run all the way up here, the Valley of the Ewes, here the Megat River, Megat Water, and here the Esk, White Esk, Black Esk the Esk coming on down. The distribution of these farmsteads is to some extent taphonomically determined in that there has been destruction of some of these sites. But by and large, they form a relatively even distribution along each valley bottom. It would appear that these sites have uh, a division which focuses upon the river which controls a, an even stretch of the floodplain and then has, to, has land reaching back onto the hill. There are no land boundaries to, def, to, uh, to justify that assumption. But if some of these sites are sat, are sat next door to each other, literally, on either side of the burn, and then you can, you can see the way in which the, the land on either side is self-defining um, as, as a unit. Now, that's all supposition. And I'm sorry, this side isn't really magenta colored, is it? So I must put that right. Um, but this shows you, if you then do a size analysis of all these sites, uh, that they fall into really quite clear groups by size. Um, some bigger, some smaller. Um, the big ones are relatively few, and the smaller ones are relatively many. And in each valley, you do have examples of all of them, all the types. So it is possible, possible, that we may be looking at a hierarchical arrangement here of farms by valley uh, under some as it were, superior authority. Suggestion. Each farm might have been looking at something like 50 cattle in terms of the ground which appears to be around it. 50 cattle. One bull, 12 cows, 12 heifers and steers over three years. There's a small run of sheep, maybe, some pigs, not many, and garden cultivation oats and barley on the floodplain. That would be the way of it, or might be the way of it. And farmsteads of this kind occur massively all over Dumfries. There are thousands of them all over the south of Scotland of one kind or another, either 
their enclosed settlements, scoop settlements. Uh, they can be settlements in the east uh, are of a similar kind but differently constructed. Uh, there is a vast variety and range of them. George Joby was the first to excavate the example in this area, in Estdale, um, at Bunis, and there the date would appear to be something like um, in the first century AD or BC. And there are the farms shown again against the Royal Commission map um, of um, this area made in 1981. Right, well, that's enough for the romancing. Now back to facts. Now, because we've gone to a very wet place, I've changed the colour uh, from orange uh, from the Hillfort to green for over rig. Um, this site from the very beginning, was a bit of a puzzle. Set right by the river, it had been, the, the edge of the site, the, the, the uh, eastern edge of the site, had been eroded away by the river to form a cliff. Uh, you can see it on the site there, at the focus of this field system. And here you see something of the nature of uh, Richard Tipping's work, looking at the way in which this site has been shaped over time. And it would emerge from Richard's work that probably this site was never very much larger than it is today. Uh, here you see the cliff. Here you see the weather. Um, here the river running past. It, again, could be very variable in the way it behaved. Um, and here, outside this inner ditch with its bank on the outside, that platform in a platform, ditch, bank on the outside, you then had another ditch, another bank, and then another ditch, and another bank. That's then there. So this is a triphalate monument ditches on the outside of, di of banks, set at the bottom of a deep depression, which is the focus for a runoff of over three or four square kilometers. So it's soaking wet all the time. Of course, I can't say anything about the prehistory of the site, but to the present day, in summer, it's hell on earth. Um, because, first of all, it's very wet, but then the midges sense that there are people there. And um, life becomes pretty well intolerable. This is Richard's work and shows the enclosure here as it would have formed. This is the river uh, before the site was built. If the site, when the site was built at some time around there, um, you have the formation like that, and that has become this and this over time. But it is unlikely, extremely unlikely, that the site was ever a perfect circular site. It would have always been a part uh, of a circle built against um, the cliff of the river. Um, the river may have been closer um, to the foot of the cliff, which is why it was eroded. Um, but uh, it, it, that would appear to be the situation um, uh, how the modern shape of the site was attained. There you see um, the uh, site with its, its cliff, the shape of the site there, here, uh, the river on this side. There is the figure of the little boy who was married on Saturday. The um, plan of the site was, again, um, pretty puzzling. You had two semicircular double ring groove houses, what you would call double ring groove houses. But unfortunately, they were archaeologically very, very corrupt. And they were 
in a state of active collapse over the cliff edge. All the stratigraphy had seriously been disturbed. And there was a limited amount, you could say, about them. Then you had a palisade here running around the span of the uh, enclosure. The palisade was set in a clay platform which had been laid down over the surface of this enclosure because you couldn't possibly have operated on the surface of this enclosure, which was just peat, uh, which had been, and if you walked on the surface of this peat, it simply puddled and you went in up to your knees. So it, the, the, the clay platform had to be and was put down to enable people to operate on the surface at the bottom of this depression. The clay was derived from the ditch. The ditch was dug in the impermeable riverine clay which had been laid down uh, in prehistory, uh, geological time uh, on the site. However, that clay only, as it were, reached as far as about here. And then these ditches were dug in river gravel, which had formed uh, at dates even before that. This palisade, therefore, was dug th through something like half, um, sorry, a quarter of a meter of clay into the peat. These palisade posts, therefore, can hardly have been more than a meter high because they simply would never have been stable enough. You would push them over all the time uh, because they were stuck in this goo. So you had a low palisade, apparently, surrounding an area, which there were two ringditch houses, if that's what they were, and then you had here a rectangular or trapezoid uh, stone structure. And we'll look at that. So you've got in the stratigraphy the peat, the clay lying on top of the peat. You can see there the palisade dug through the clay down into the peat. Well, there's the stone trapezoid structure. So there's not a lot of say about that because it really is unparalleled, as far as I know, on any site of this date. And we have a very good idea of the date of this site because the water, the ditch was waterlogged and very large quantities of timber, wood, were found in the ditch. Here you have the date for two. There, there is the palisade. Heavily stone-packed, you can see. Perhaps buried witness to its difficulties. And then immediately behind the palisade, you have two halves built up against it, which had been fired and burned for some time. Here are the halves. And there are the radiocarbon dates from the halves. So it would appear, if the palisade remained in use for any time, it was not for very long. Because this site, as we shall see, probably didn't exist before 70 AD. And by a date sometime between well, 100, 150, these, the palisade had become irrelevant and people were building halves against it. And furthermore, it seems to me anyway that the ring ditch houses, sorry, the ring groove houses were also a secondary addition on the site. Their purpose appears to be associated with the deposition of tiny fragments of iron slag and charcoal and uh, coal, quite large quantities of coal. The houses are also associated with concentrations of these whetstones, of which a very large number were found. Those whetstones are only found at one other location, and that is in the uppermost layers, well above the silting of the ditch and well into the peat silt, the time of peat formation. So when the whetstones, which characterize the activity in these houses, were when they were in action, 
uh, was when the ditch was very largely filled up, which is again the argument for the houses being secondary. So you have a primary structure which is a palisaded settlement, palisaded uh, enclosure on a clay floored constructed platform um, with on that platform a trapezoid stone setting. At a later date, perhaps, you have the uh, building of these two ring roof houses. The ditch was causewayed. Ah, I thought. Home again. Here we are. And these causeways would have had the effect of retaining water in the ditch. So it would look as though the purpose of this ditch was to hold water, was to be a moat, if you like. And the ditch, as I say, produced very large quantities of wood, um, which indicates that the, the dell in which the site was located uh, was well wooded, um, that uh, there are structures on the site which have become dilapidated, and bits of those structures have got in amongst this wood. And then you have the two ditches outside that. Each one was built on the old ground surface, so you had here the inner ditch. The bank of that inner ditch was piled on the outside. Here you have the medium ditch, its bank was piled on top of the bank of the inner ditch. Here you have the outer ditch, its bank piled on top of a subsidiary bank from this ditch here, and then a, a subsidiary bank on the outside here. These banks were placed on an absolutely clean old land surface. Nothing there. And we did excavate some fairly big slices. Nothing. So you have to assume that these outer banks were subsidiary to, but immediately subsidiary to, the inner enclosure, or as near as immediately as archaeology can, can define. Within the inner ditch, um, we found a whole series of wooden objects. These beautiful drawings are done uh, by Gordon Thomas and uh, with the assistance of Alan Braby in, in um, emendation at one or two points. And these objects, where they can be named at all, and Crone has done the work on this, this is Anne's work. Um, we have some wood, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, some woodworking debris here. This is. Um, lathe turnings, which have been spun off the bottom of a, a bowl or something of that kind. But you then have a wooden sword, fragments of what may be a, other wooden blades. You have what appear to be models of boats. Um, a range of objects which Anne feels, uh, in terms of wood assemblages from other sites, looks very um, odd. Uh, ceremonial? Well, who knows? But not random domestic refuse. And there's no pottery. And there's no other debris of any kind. No bone. You might have expected some bone to survive in this waterlogged circumstance. None. <coughs> Along with that, you get this rather splendid skillet, whatever you want to call it, up here. Um, what it's for, no idea, of course. Um, but you do find little metal uh, things of this character, much smaller, um, on, in ritual contexts of uh, Celtic late Iron Age burials. And they have cruciform patterns on the back, the metal ones. This you could, of course, su suggest as a cruciform Model on, uh, modeling on the back, attained by the grain of the wood, and 
purposely, perhaps, selected for that purpose. Um, so you have a whole range of objects which are not <laughs> absolutely random and absolutely uh, standard domestic kit. The dates which are extracted from the primary material in the ditch on this site are displayed there. And they fall um, between, what, uh, 100 BC and 100, 200 AD. Uh, that is the date of the site. So this site was being built when, probably, almost certainly, when Roman occupation had taken place of southern Scotland. And that idea is reinforced uh, by the existence of these glass bangle fragments, which uh, appear to be of um, Roman glass. So um, there you have a brief summary. The surrounding earthworks, well, um, we were very lucky. And we got, actually, would you believe, a radiocarbon date. Well, I didn't expect that um, from these. You had, there were, of course, a limit to what could be done. Um, but we were able to excavate ditch butts close to the hill fort where it might be expected that debris, fag ends and things like that, um, would be dropped into the ditch. You had evidence of multiple fence replacement, multiple fencing lines built on the very low banks which surrounded these ditches. They could only have been low banks in terms of the, de de the depth of the ditches themselves. And building a fence on a bank like that has a great advantage that it keeps cattle away from the fence, shoving over the fence because they can't get up the wee bank which gives the palisade, the fence itself, stability. So it is a, a sound way of building um, a retention, animal retention uh, barrier. And these barriers, as I say, stretch for three or four kilometers by one kilometer in all directions. Um, beside this particular earthwork here. Uh, we will see, I think, the next, no, no, sorry, I beg your pardon. You see here, beside this earthwork disappearing off in this direction and down that ride there, um, there was, in fact, a, a cobble laid roadway. Um, that cobble laid roadway was buried beneath a thin layer of peat. Um, and it, it, it is difficult to say that it was not associated directly with the earthwork. Um, so there may be a pathway beside that earthwork, leading up beside the earthwork here and ultimately through the gateway here into the annex and indeed to the fort. So that, I think, um, covers the enclosure system very briefly um, the date we had I'm sorry I beg your pardon the date we had from a deposit of tiny fragments of charcoal which looked ex it, it looked exactly like what you would expect a very ruined um, burnt um, panel of hurdling would look. Uh, those dates are there on the slide, here and here. Do you see you have dates which range again through to 200 AD sort of time. So, or in that case, 400. So it looks as though this system was going out of work sometime after 200, something like that, AD. So you have a system of extense, extensive cattle retention, let us say, and this is me now moving into discussion, 
uh, a system of cattle retention associated with the late annex built by the hill fort. The hill fort at this time, we have no evidence, was occupied at all. That that system of cattle retention continues for maybe two, maybe 300 years. It goes out of action. And then we see the construction of a vitrified fort on the site, which starts sometime about 300, 400, and goes forward for a couple of hundred years, probably. Now, it's all shaky. I accept that. Um, but how else do you explain it? How else do you put this together to make some sort of sense? And we now have, I hope, a series of questions anyway for the future. The Richard was involved with um, David Robinson and Bill Boyd um, in the production of uh, a study which shows roughly um, how these how the development was taking place on the site. The site did produce, from the peat beneath the clay, a history of the land use and um, uh, development at the bottom of this dell, not necessarily applying to the wider landscape, um, at the bottom of this dell from around 3000, 4000 BC onwards until the point, of course, when it was capped with clay, um, and which, of course, meant that the last years of the peat sequence were tended to be a little corrupt, because people trampling. And then you have the formation of the peat into ditch, which succeeds the desertion and uh, disuse of the site. So that is the, um, the, the history there before the site uh, was uh, built. And then there is the development um, after the site's completion. Um, there are one or two interesting things. I mean, first of all, the wooded nature of the of the of the uh, of the enclosure itself and its, its immediate circumstances. Uh, the way in which I was fascinated um, that the, by around uh, 1020, there's a lot of clearance going on, and you see the appearance of these nitrogen fixers at that early date, which might be associated with monks being present or their, or their sub subservient bodies being present uh, in the area and bringing in ideas from the Mediterranean. Um, and then, finally, we see the appearance of uh, extensive pine plantation uh, in the record. Now, what is this site? The... Um, the only way that I can bring myself to it, as it were, explain it, is by personal experience. One day, um, it, it was, it, as I say, it never stopped raining. So one's disappearance into Lockerbie to refuel the vehicle, go to the bank, and have a quick one, um, was regarded with disfavor by those who were left on the site. And one day, I was going up to the road, and the road was about 300 metres from the site, up on the main road, where the vehicle was parked. And as I went up the hill, I, I hope my audience will forgive me if, for a moment I venture into a verbatim account. As I went up the hill, I was about 200 metres away, and I heard this voice say, Sotte voce, there goes that bugger into Lockerbie, when we're all working here in, in the rain. Um, and I thought, goodness me, I mean, I wasn't meant to hear that. And um, it was really a, a revelation because the, the, the auditorium effect of this dell um, focusing in on this platform at the bottom, um, it is like a theatre. Now, you have this platform, um, very odd circumstances in terms of archaeological deposits and all the rest of it. But there it is, with the palisade and the moat. And on this platform, I'm not suggesting it's panto that's going on, but something is going on which people are watching and listening to. 
And these banks are, in fact, terraces where people sat, and relatively dry terraces. I say relatively dry um, terraces that you could sit down on. Well, OK, that's a nice idea. Better put it into magenta, I think. Um, but are there any parallels? Well, of course there aren't any parallels. We haven't got any parallels with this kind of site. However, if you look across the Irish Sea, there are a number of sites there. They're called royal sites. Um, and uh, excavators there uh, have reconstructed them, Bernard Wales did, um, as at a Denoilin here, he thought that this was, in fact, an open area of terraced seating um, for the observation of judicial uh, um, events. Uh, it may not be judicial, or ceremonial, or religious, whatever, events. Um, crownings, that kind of thing. And that feature repeats itself at a number of these Irish sites, as you can see on the map here. And there is over rig. I mean, it isn't that far. And um, it does seem to me that we might possibly have uh, a circumstance of exchange of ideas here. We know that in Tacitus tells us that there is an, an encounter between Roman soldiers and Irish people um, in uh, the Southwest at that time. So is this where they get the idea from? Or is this where they get the idea from? Um, after all, we're now in the period of a Roman military occupation. Is it possible they got the idea from the Romans? And um, that, that's the way in which uh, these uh, things were brought to their attention. It's also interesting that, <coughs> excuse me, Colin Hazelgrove, um, working at Stanwyck, has also made the parallel between a number of circular structures in the earlier stages of Stanwyck and the Irish material that I've just put before you. So now I really must hurry up and stop. That's just to illustrate where we sit um, in the history of the Roman occupation of Scotland. You have a temporary camp at Raven Foot, uh, which is undoubtedly uh, um, early, and then you have the small fort at Raven Foot, which is a little later. Um, now, uh, there's the temporary camp. The Roman military diet was almost entirely based upon cattle. Um, digging of the sites, Roman sites, produces by far the heaviest um, preponderance of the bone evidence suggests the consumption of cattle. And such evidence as we have from the literature um, would suggest that the Roman ration was basically beef, and they preferred beef. These diagrams show that Roman military meat diet in the, on the frontier zones of, 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 of um, Britain was, again, largely beef. And you have to then consider where all this beef came from. Um, certainly, the native Celtic meat diet uh, was also quite strongly beef, and there was plenty of beef around. I just put this slide on to remind you um, that what, what 350 cattle look like, that's, that's what it looks like. Um, you can't transmit cattle any distance by boat. Adam Smith said that is the most expensive, pointless way of transmitting cattle. In a boat the size of the Blackfriars boat, which you see there, um, you would probably get 20 cattle. You would need to, in, in, to uh, store something like um, 250 gallons of water on board the boat in order to get 20 cattle 
from Newcastle up to Grammond. Um, you would then have to dung the boat out in no uncertain manner um, before you could use it again. So, I mean, there really is not a way to do it. You would drive them across the ground. You would try and keep them off the roads, otherwise uh, the roads would become uh, pretty clogged or one way or another. Therefore, you would probably transfer them on the basis of drove roads. And we know that such drove roads exist all over the Cheviots. The dating of them is virtually impossible, but there are instances where they seem to do damage to the outer works of hill forts, suggesting that they are also there, and not, I say also, and not only, but also there during the prehistoric period. There's some indicators of that. That's the uh, little <coughs> circular things that Colin was suggesting uh, were associated with the Irish background. I have suggested, I'm afraid, um, that Stanwick itself may be another of, or used as another, of these great concentrating centres, which I now begin to feel is what we're seeing here. The great centres where you concentrate cattle so that they can be brought into the uh, acceptance of the army. Because for the very small number of soldiers, relatively small, that were accommodated at the west end of Hadrian's Wall, and here I've mercilessly used, I hope not too unwisely, David Breeze's work here on the number of soldiers in the, in, in the uh, garrison, then you're looking at the need for 3,500 cattle a year to feed the number of soldiers with the ration that has been stipulated. We know the ration. So we know how much weight, and therefore we know how many cattle. So something of the order of 3,500 cattle would be required for the garrison at the west end of Hadrian's Wall. That would have to be raised from the number of farms that we we have on, uh, in the, on the ground. Um, and you would see that the outline here of blue in blue is the area you would have needed if you taxed the population at 10%, which was the normal Roman taxation standard. If you tax the population at 10%, then they would need 10 times as many, or nine times, 10 times as many, 10 times as many cattle. And you're looking at a very considerable national herd, if you like, from which the Romans would have had to take their slice. That has important implications for population, as well as the numbers of cattle. It has also important implications for the supply of horses. And I don't think, really, I've got time to go on about that. There is a long tradition of horse use in Scotland. It goes right back. Training horses for charity was cha chariotry was a, a very difficult business. Um, this is not work for amateurs. Um, the horses, the idea of Harcourt that horses were just impounded from the wild and then trained up is impractical. Uh, they would have to be trained, born, bred, handled, manhandled all the time in order to bring them to the stage where they would be amenable to this kind of work. There must have been horse farms. The Roman army would have needed at least 500, a supply of 500 horses a year in order to keep their cavalry regiments mobile. Now, you know, 500 horses is a lot of horses. It's one foal per mare per year. Um, and you have to have, therefore, a sustainable herd of horses to produce that kind of outcome. So it does seem to me that we're starting, or maybe starting, I would like to think we're starting, 
a picture which, if repeated enough, we could really begin to get a hold on what the population of animals in the south of Scotland was at this time. And from that, surely, we would begin to find the population of the area itself. And that would be a valuable addition. Thank you very much. Thank you.